Uh, let's have uh, Brother Bill, and so I don't have to now, but um, uh, have, have heard his name, known about him for years and years, and then finally got to meet him at, uh, I think we met at Brother Green's funeral last year was where we first met. Um, and uh, I don't know if we've seen each other since the funeral. Oh, that's right. Yes. Yeah. It was so memorable. I forgot. Him. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um, we have a uh, we do have a kindred spirit in the jesting and sarcasm department, and uh, so um, but uh, he wants to be known. He could be known for a lot of things, but the thing that he wants to be known most for is a friend of Mark Thren. And so I would like to have what's that? Oh, opposite of that. All right, sorry about that. But uh, I'm going to just, we're going to turn the service over to them. They're going to sing. He's going to preach. You handle the invitation if you want to do an invitation, however you want. Introduce your family. Tell us a little bit about you. And uh, it's, uh, it's Maryland or Pennsylvania, right? Okay. Uh, here's another connection. I don't know if I said this uh, when I talked about it this morning, but uh, it, Brother Ben is out of your church, right? Ben Thren. Uh, so him and his wife, Sarah, who are expecting their first child in July, uh, are members of their church, and, and he's got a ministry of helps, uh, and so that's the, also their sending church. So, Brother Schweitzer, bring your family, whatever you want to do, and we pray the Lord helps you and uses you to be a blessing. Amen. right outside of Philadelphia. I'm my wife, Laura, and we've been married 24 years next month. And uh, so this is my first wife, and uh, amen. <laughs> amen. That's true. And uh, this is my oldest, Lee. He's uh, in the, I was going to say red, he's with the jacket on there. And uh, Landon, uh, Lee is 11, and Landon is 9. And they're a lot of fun. And uh, dad's my dad used to call them, they called them the Schweitzer boys, and uh, so uh, they, uh, they're a blessing, and I appreciate uh, my son, really started at the church trying to take, take some leadership, started a youth choir, and uh, just been, it's only, only, only four or five of them now, but they'll, they'll, uh, they'll grow, and, but I'm excited about what the Lord has done in, in our life, our church, um, I, we've had the friends in uh, for years and years, and I heard about Brother Cobb. Uh, for years, and uh, he's known about me and still had us come, so that's a blessing, <laughs> and so, amen. Thank the Lord for how he takes care of us, and uh, the Lord is just good. I got this morning and I started my day. Forsaken, I'm never alone. One day I'm moving to my brand new home. I'm blessed beyond measure. Just look close, you'll see. My Lord is taking good care of me. I'm counting my blessings as a journey along. Good friends and a family and a place to call home. The church where I worship the Bible. I say I'm forgiven and it's buried at last. The bloodshed at Calvary now speaks for me. My Lord has taken good care of me. I'm never forsaken, I'm never alone. One day I'm moving to my brand new home. I'm blessed beyond measure, just look close. 
shall see my Lord has taken good care of me. I'm never forsaken, I'm never alone. One day I'm moving to my brand new home. I'm blessed beyond measure, just look close, you'll see. My Lord has taken good care of me. I'm blessed beyond measure, just look close, you'll see. take good care of us, and it's because he loved me. This song, uh, we've sung this song, um, this is a little while, but I've sung this song ever since I was a teenager, heard this song, Because He Loved Me, and it uh, talks about the Lord suffering for us and dying and, and then raising from the dead, uh, but I added a, a third verse on there because he's coming back. Thank Amen. the Lord for that. Suffered it all. He suffered. 
good singing them boys just belted it out that's how it's supposed to be done amen you boys keep it up amen and then you know when you get to be 20 25 you'll have a big bus and be touring the family with your country or touring the country with your family amen 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 john chapter 3 john chapter 3 and uh, this will be the first Thing I say, I won't keep you long. <laughs> Amen. You don't, you don't have to believe that. Only believe the stuff I say out of the Bible. Amen. Yeah. Amen. You got a good preacher, he'll tell you the same thing. Amen. And uh, if he's preaching the, the Word of God, uh, you can trust it. Any, anytime you go away from it. I, I, got a, I got a little chart I made. I like Microsoft Excel and, and, and all that stuff. So I got a chart I made, and it's the proximity from the pulpit. And, and so the, as far away as the pulpit, you get away from the pulpit. When a guy gets way over here, that's as far as you start getting a little undoctrinal. You get, you get over here, you know, your forced alliteration, stuff like that. And you keep going this way, you're talking about biscuits and gravy, yeah. red top milk. And the further away from the pulpit, and your, especially your notes, yeah. uh, you start getting messed up. Uh, but uh, that's a lot, a lot of times they do away with the pulpit altogether, do away with the Bible altogether. Yeah. Amen. But uh, I, I do, I love the Lord. I told, uh, I told uh, your preacher, I told Brother Cobb, I said, uh, I'll be here. And uh, while I'm preaching, or while we're singing, I said, we're not the Thren family, uh, but we love the Lord. He said, we'll, we'll amen, just to kind of encourage you by saying amen every now and then anyway. So I think you said, I read it back again. You actually, you actually didn't throw us under the, you threw out the, the Threns under the bus. So that was nice. That was a blessing. <laughs> under their own bus. Amen. Uh, the kids call me, the Thren kids call me Uncle Ed, and uh, so I made a sign for their bus. I don't know if you ever, did you ever show you the sign? I made a plaque for their bus, and it's out of, Jer I think it's Jeremiah, I can't remember the, the exact verse, but it says, and they shall howl and say, alas, how is it broken down? <laughs> and I got, I made a plaque up last year, and it's green, it's, it's really nice. You got to get them when they come in, Amen. <laughs> Next time they're broken down in your parking lot, you can look at the sign. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. But I love Brother Mark's good friend, and I appreciate just the opportunity to preach. And, and, and uh, just wanted to come over here, heard about your preacher for a while, wanted to just come over and, and see the church, get, to get by and, and see it. And, you know, it's amazing the Lord worked it out because we were going to try to drive down, and it just wasn't going to work. And then there was uh, just trying to figure out if we were going to come. But my sister-in-law, who is Dale Chassie's wife, that's my um, wife. She has two sisters, one pastor's pastors in uh, Ohio. Uh, her husband pastors in Ohio. Let me, make, <laughs> let me clarify that. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I'm from the New Life Temple, the, the apostolic faith or something. <laughs> Amen. My wife's a pastor, and we got her, both of our pictures on our tracks to say pastors on there. But her sister is a pastor, pastor's wife, in Ohio. And uh, her other sister is Michelle Chassie right down the road here, about 40 minutes, 45 minutes away or so, or depending on how fast you're trying to get to the service uh, over here in Dover, Foxcroft. Uh, it's about 40 minutes or so uh, getting over here. Amen. <laughs> Am I saying everything right here? Dover Foxcroft, all right, <laughs> amen. But uh, I know Brother Bob Nagowski, he's going to be with us in uh, August, the second week in August, looking forward to having Bad Bob in. My yeah. boys love Brother Bob, and uh, he's a blessing. We got stamps on our Bad Bob tracks that says, come meet Bad Bob in person. And uh, so we got that, and we got a, got a, a lady in, in the church, she stamps thousands and thousands. She's in her 80s. She wouldn't let me, want me to tell you how old she is. She's about 84, I think she is. She stamps every track that doesn't, we don't already get pre-printed. Some of them we get our information on. She stamps every one of those. 
And I, I'm sure she's going to get a reward for every stamp that she puts on there. So she's been stamping, I'm sure, all this week, stamping bad Bob tracks uh, while we've been away. Uh, but we, uh, we're, just, we're just glad to be in the house of God. And my dad started our church back in 1982 and uh, pastored for 36 years. And uh, we, um, we're down there right, right near the airport, Philadelphia airport, if you've ever been down Philadelphia area in, in Pennsylvania. And I give directions to people all the time. I, up here, it's easy. I just say, get on 95, go south till you get to the Philly airport on your left, take the next exit, turn right, left, 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 and the church is on the right. <laughs> you can't miss it. It's easy. Just get it. Go, go east to get to 95, and you guys will find it. You'll be there in, in, in a little while, all right? Uh, amen. If you hurry, you could make it in for Wednesday service or something. Amen. But let's get right into the message here. Uh, I, I will say... I, I'm, I'm terrible with the introductions here, but I, I do want to say, uh, after my dad pastor for 36 years, he passed away in 2019. The church called me to be the pastor. I'd been there as assistant pastor for 13 years already and as associate for a little while there. And so the church surprisingly still voted me in, and I've been there since uh, April 7th, 2019. And the uh, Lord's just been good, and uh, I just appreciate, uh, just appreciate the opportunity to serve Him. And uh, the, the Bible says God... It says Abraham believed God and, and God counted unto him for righteousness. And Paul said God counted him faithful. I think it's the same amount, same amount of grace for God to put you in the ministry as it is. It's not the same thing uh, as salvation, but it's, it's all the Lord. Uh, he counts you faithful and we're not, we're not uh, what, what we uh, should be. Uh, none of us deserve to be a pastor or be in the ministry, but God counts you faithful puts you in the ministry, and uh, gives us gives an opportunity to serve Him. And uh, so you're in John chapter 3, John chapter 3, in verse number 14. It says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Look at verse 15. There's a cause here. It says that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, I can't read this. I really, get, I, I really read verse 14 and 15. You almost, you know, that's where the message is, but I can't stop there. Verse four, uh, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse number 14 again, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have eternal life. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'll bless the message. Thank you for the folks who stayed around this afternoon, enjoyed the fellowship, and are here to, to get another meal here around your word. I pray that you just bless us. Give us ears to hear, Lord, and then feet and hands to be swift to do your, world, do your will and do your work. I pray that you'll bless this church here. Thank you for this being a light in, commu in the community here. Lord, I pray that you'll see uh, down the years, Lord, many more people turn to you. Lord, get saved and be joined to this work here. I pray that you'll bless it and help us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Go back to Numbers chapter 21 because Jesus references in John chapter 3, he references Moses. Did you ever think about the times that Jesus, the things that Jesus made a point to mention things specifically, many times are things that people have questions about. You know, what are the most disputed things in the Bible? Creation, right? The flood. Jonah and the whale. You know, Jesus talked about those three things. Talked about in the beginning, God created them male and female. Created he then. Right. Right, that's, that's pretty easy. That's what we should tell our, uh, our uh, Senate, tell, tell Congress, amen, male and female. Tell, tell your state rep down there, right, in Augusta, <laughs> amen. You, 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 listen, you, they're so messed up because we've, got, we've become unmoored from the word of God. As a nation, the Bible is not our. Uh, we don't. We don't. We don't. We don't even recognize the founding of our nation that's founded on principles of the Word of God. Right. They want to sandblast everything. They want to go down and, and remove uh, any kind of monument to the founding fathers. Right. Any kind of monument to this. Any, anything that has to do with God, they try to. As Romans one says, they retain not God in their knowledge. Anytime it reminds them of God, well, we can't have that. That's why they hate marriage so much. That's why they had the Supreme Court overturn what really what, and redefine what marriage really is. Right. You can't redefine marriage because it, it, it's God putting a man and a woman together. 
Amen. You, you can't do that. Uh, you can't change the meaning of a word and just, it, it basically has destroyed what marriage is. So our government, our nation has kind of just become un, unhooked from the word of God. And so Jesus answers these things. God made a male and female. Jonah, the sign that was given to, uh, to uh, the nation or to that generation. He says, the sign uh, that there should be no sign given to this generation, but the sign of Jonas the prophet. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, even so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. That's the sign. One of the mo- biggest things, people, one of those things, oh, there's no way that Jonah could have lived in the whale for three days and three nights. Oh, what about Noah? As in the days of Noah, what about Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah, and God rained fire and brimstone on them? Jesus spoke of these things. He's the sinless, perfect Son of God, and if He's talking about those things as just matter of fact, then I think we should just take God at His word. Numbers chapter 20, you're already there. 21, I should say. Numbers 21. Numbers 21. I got a new Bible. It's a new old Bible. So I, I collect this and I got to keep it, hold it down. Brother Cobb, it's kangaroo skin. Got to hold it down. It, it'll jump off the pulpit. Amen. I got this. This is 1962 or 3. Uh, found, found this thing. And uh, so, love the Word of God. I use a Schofield. How many use a Schofield reference Bible? I know you use a Schofield reference Bible. All right. And, nope. Everybody else? Handicapped here. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I, I think it's the, Harold Seitler says the best study Bible out there. He said, if you don't have a Schofield reference Bible, you're in great need of a Bible is what he said. Amen. Well, I don't know what you got. Is that NIV or ESV? ESV. Amen. The Ed Schweitzer version. Amen. But that's good. Look at, look at Numbers chapter 21. And just read verse 4 down. It says, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom, and the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. Sometimes it's, it's easy to be discouraged uh, in the way as, as you go along. But don't be discouraged of the way. Don't, don't, be, don't be weary of the journey. Sometimes you get weary in the journey. Don't get weary of it. As people just get, I'm tired of living for God. I'm tired of doing it. You're just doing it in your flesh. You're going to be tired. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Look at verse number four at the end. He says, they were discouraged because of the way. So what happens? When people get discouraged, they start doing what the children of Israel did here. Verse number 5, the, peop- the people spake against God and against Moses. They're talking about, they, they think they're talking against Moses, but they're really talking about God. And when people are talking about your preacher, when they're running him down to you, listen, don't, don't, let, people, don't let people use your ears as a garbage can to talk about other people in your church, to talk about your preacher. Amen. Verse number five, it says, Mo, they spake against God and against Moses. They, weren't, they didn't just pick, oh, we're going to talk about against God. Most people won't say, I'm going to talk against God. They're going to talk against the man of God. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? This is a common theme for them. You brought us out here to kill us. Because there were no graves in Egypt, right? It says there is no bread. Neither is there any water. And our soul loatheth loatheth this light bread. Isn't that funny? Oh, there's no bread, but we don't like this light bread. They lied. God gave them bread from heaven. Jesus said, your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. It says in verse number 5, he says, and our soul loatheth this light bread. You know what they were? They were loathing the honeycomb. God was... God was providing that every day they'd wake up, except for Saturday morning, the Sabbath, when they would wake up every day, they'd just walk out their tent, grab whatever they, they, they could have for that day. God provided for them. They didn't like what God had provided. They wanted something else. Look in verse number 6. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. And they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Verse 7. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, that when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. And the children of Israel set forth. 
and pitched in Oboth. And it tells, it tells you where they went. Down there in verse number 9, Moses made a serpent of brass and put it on a pole. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'll bless the message this morning. I pray that you'll help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Moses, number one, the servant Moses lifted up the serpent. The servant Moses lifts up the serpent. Jesus says, as Moses lifted up. And I thought about that in John chapter 3. He says, as Moses lifted up the serpent. He didn't say, he, he didn't say it like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, and so I'm going to be lifted up. He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent. It's a simile. It's, it's in the same manner that Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Jesus, Jesus even says, he says, and I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. This he spake, signifying what death he would die. He was talking about his death. He was going to die on the cross. He knew it. I think it's so funny when the disciples, they come to the Lord and they talk to him. He says, and it says, then began Jesus to talk about how he was going to go to the chief priests uh, and the scribes and they were going to crucify him and the third day he was going to rise again. And they're like, what? (laughs) He told them so plainly. He told them not just in parables. He told them, hey, I'm going to live, I'm going to be be, uh, uh, treated spitefully and abused and they're going to, they're going to beat me and torture me and then they're going to nail me to a cross and I'm going to, three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead. And they, they just, phew. it's amazing how many people will miss just the plain teaching of the Word of God. Some people don't want to hear what, it's, what He says. Sometimes they're just blinded. In verse number uh, 5, the people spake against Moses. We see the reason. In all three of these, these thoughts here, you're going to see a reason, you're going to see a reaction, and you're going to see a result. Moses lifts up the serpent in the wilderness. Number one, The reason is because of the fiery serpents. The fiery serpents. Look in verse number 6. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. You think this this doesn't seem like a big deal. Because we're so guilty of this all the time. We do similar stuff. We we speak against the Lord. We might not say it out loud. We complain. We murmur. Mm -hmm. The gainsaying of Korah. Just, Just talking. And we talk, so a lot of times it's talking up here, amen? But it's, we're talking. Or we're, we're letting the devil influence our mind as far as what we're thinking about and just being negative. It's easier for us to, to, to be negative. It's easier for us to just think, oh man, I, if I were running this church, I'd do it this way. If I, you don't, you're not standing behind the pulpit. You're not having to deal with all the problems. of You know, a lot of people say, well, I would do this and I would do that and I'd do this in the service. You don't know what a shepherd knows. Amen. You don't know what he's got to deal with. Well, I would have said it this way. Well, you don't know who's he's try- who he's trying to help or who he's trying not to offend and hurt. Well, I would take care of business. I'd clean up. Amen. They, they got the John, you know, Bo Energies, James and John, Sons of Thunder. Lord, should, should, would, would you that we call down fire from heaven as Elijah did? Right. <laughs> Sounds like a great... I thought about starting our church a flogging ministry. <laughs> Every Tuesday night, the flogging ministry assembles, right? You got some deadbeat dad. You got somebody who won't provide for he's worse than an infidel, right? You got somebody who beats up on his wife and kids. You send the flogging ministry out, amen? And take, it sounds like it's, it's a good thing. Preachers can laugh at that, amen? Amen. I think we'd have a lot of people sign up at our church, maybe here, flogging ministry on Tuesdays, amen? That's, that's James and John. We want to call down fire from heaven and consume them. And that's, that's the way we get. We don't know exactly what the Lord's trying to do, but we, we know how we would do it. Look in verse number uh, 6. The Lord sends the fire serpent. It didn't seem like a big deal. You're reading down through. It says they spake against the Lord, spake against Moses. Oh, why would you bring us up here? It says we're going to die in the wilderness. There's no bread, and we're not really satisfied with this light bread anyway. There's no water here. We do the same thing. Thank God the Lord doesn't deal with us like He did with the children of Israel. You said you're running about 50% capacity. You said the mad ones, they're gone, right? Or are they still here? <laughs> this is the mad ones left? <laughs> amen. We got 50%, the, the 50% that are mad are still here, and everybody else, amen, they're gone. Amen. <laughs> the reason that Moses has to lift up the serpent in the wilderness is because of the fiery serpents, they were bitten. 
There was serpents, they were biting people, and they were dying. What's the reaction? The people prayed. Look at their prayer, though. The people prayed. There was sorrow. So a, lot of people, a lot of God's people don't get, get really sorrowful or penitent until it gets really bad. It, they waited till a lot of people died. You wonder how long that, that fiery serpent bite lasted. It doesn't seem that it was immediate, because if you got bitten and died and within five seconds, how could you ever look at the serpent on the pole? So it had to take a little while. You know, a lot of people will just wait and wait and wait until they get to get right with God to pray until it's so bad. Situation's just awful. Oh, I'll, I'll pray. When I, I'll get right with God when it gets really bad. They got bit. Now, we, can, we have the type here, obviously the typology. If you don't uh, study typology, you miss a whole lot of things in the New Testament that are hidden in the Old Testament. But there's the type of the sinner. There's the type with the sin sickness, right? You've been bitten by a serpent. It goes all the way back to Genesis 3. I mean, you, you don't have, it's not, it doesn't take very much to make that theological leap, right? The serpent... Sin, everyone's infected, right? We understand that. That's the type. But in the physical, in, in, the, in just the application here, if just the historical application, they murmur, they complain, they say, God, Moses, why have you brought us out here to kill us? There's no bread, there's no water, and we don't even like the light bread you're giving us. The reaction is the people pray. They finally, it's as much people die. How many people? And later it talks about how many people died. There's always, anytime the Bible has numbers in there, and people say, well, you know, that, that there's a problem here, there's a discrepancy here. Anytime you think there's a problem in the Bible, it's your problem. Yeah. <laughs> Amen? If it, I think uh, Gary Duty said, if you find when you read it there's something wrong, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. See, they were, the fiery serpents were there. They prayed, but you know what their problem was? They were praying for the wrong thing. They weren't praying really for, for healing. They weren't praying for a miracle of res- raising the dead. You got a lot of people dying. I don't know how long it was. Could have been a day. Could have been. It doesn't really tell you exactly how long it was. Long enough for, for Moses to uh, make a mold and pour in brass. That's a good long time. I don't think he had it. Had a mold already made. Oh, oh, fortunately, Lord, I already have a mold I can pour this. They weren't to make unto themselves any graven image. He didn't have a serpent mold all ready to go. Now, you wonder how long that took to make all those things, to get that pole and get it all together. They complained. They murmured. And then when God judged them, they wouldn't get right until people were dying left and right. Hey, don't let it get so bad in your life that you wait and wait and wait, and finally God just has to just, just totally decimate your life. Amen. I know a lot of people in our church, they're, just, you know, they're, they're going the wrong way, going the wrong way, and you say, no, you're going the wrong way. You're going the wrong way. <laughs> That's the pastor's job. Amen. Come on, get out. Get out. You're going, you're gonna go, you're, your life's going to crash and burn. You might not see it in your life. You might, you'll see it in your kid's life. You'll see it in their kids' lives. And they're, oh, no, we'll be all right. It's just a little little something. No big deal. And then when things start getting bad and God starts judging them, it could be small at first. It could be a little bit. They weren't crying and praying and begging God and begging Moses until God killed a bunch of them. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, we've sinned. Finally, we've sinned. People are dying. They, saw, they prayed for the serpents to be taken away. Did you notice that God doesn't take the serpents away? A lot of people want God to take, take their problem away. They want, they want God to, to, but they don't want to get right with God. You know what their problem wasn't that the serpents were there. It's the problem that they, when they got bit, they were, they were getting hurt. Does that make sense? It, it was the problem was that they weren't, the, the, the serpents were there because of them. The serpents, I guess my time's up, amen. Amen. You got a long cord and you just yank it. Amen. The serpents were there because of them. It it wasn't that they just were walking along through the wilderness and, and, and all of a sudden they just came upon a nest of serpents. They murmured. They complained. 
People want God to take away the punishment without getting right in the reason, really. It's because they were murmuring. They were complaining. Oh, can you take away the result of my complaining and murmuring? Take away your judgment. They're saying, take the serpents away. God didn't take the serpents away. It says in verse number 7, they say, we have sinned. Pray the Lord that He take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. I don't know what Moses said. Moses was an intercessor. Moses prays. You remember he prays for them. He says, if not, blot my name out of the book which thou hast written. He intercedes for them. He, Aaron, who has just died in the previous chapter, Aaron stands between the living and the dead. Moses here goes before God. Now, he, he talked to God face to face. Uh, there was nobody like my servant Moses. He says in verse number uh, 8, the Lord finally answers Moses. I don't know how long Moses prays, but the Lord tells him what to do. He said, make a serpent. Now, this goes against everything you, you think. But Moses, I want you to make a serpent, make a brazen serpent. Lord, I thought you said don't, don't make into the any graven image. And a lot of people, you know, they won't have any kind of, and I'm fine with that. Amish people don't only want your, their picture taken, right? It's a, it's a graven image in a sense. Some of that, they, they, they wouldn't want to be photographed. Uh, some people wouldn't have a, a Hummel or what's the other, you know, Kim Anderson figurines. Listen, I get my wife the willow tree. I'm seeing the willow tree things, right? Those faceless creeps, right? Those things, we used to get those, right? They're not a graven image where you're going to bow yourself down to them. Right. Amen? Uh, and I understand it, again, people, but what God said is don't make unto thee. A lot of people don't understand the, the King James Bible. God has preserved the, uh, the case of the, of, the, of the pronouns. Gender, number, and case is all preserved in there. You talk about gender. You know how many genders are in, right? You got, you got masculine, feminine, and neuter. That's it. Amen. You have masculine pronouns for God every time. Yep. Amen. You don't, you don't have feminine pronouns for God. Right. Amen. But when you have a the in the Bible, it's a singular. That's why all of your Ten Commandments and all the new translations mess it up. You shall not kill. If you follow those translations, you got to go back to the original, right? you got to go back to, it doesn't exist anywhere, but you would have to go back. Let's look at the Hebrew where he says, you shall not kill. Oh, we find out that's singular. Wouldn't that be easier just to have it in English? Yes. Thou shalt not kill. Right. Otherwise, nations couldn't go to war. Otherwise, capital punishment. Right. Otherwise, God's provision there in Genesis, if a man shed another man's blood, by man shall his blood be required. Right. So, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not make unto thee, singular, any graven image. God's telling Moses to do something that at its face. We think, oh, that's going against God's command. Second commandment, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. But it's not. The result, or I'm sorry, the reaction here, the people praise, God made a way. What was the thing? What was the command? Look and we sing it. Look and live. He got 900 and something. How many pages in that, that songbook? I got a workout just holding the songbook. Amen. Did you just get those songbooks? A few months ago. Brand new. It's good. I like that. I'm looking at That's good paper. I've heard about those songbooks. And I like all the scripture references in there. That's good. Amen. I was getting a little workout. I mean, my soul-stirring songs and hymns we have from Sword of the Lord, not quite as heavy doctrinally as well. But... They, they took out all the repentance out of their songs. Amen. But in verse number, verse number uh, 9, he says, Moses made a serpent. God made a way. You know what's amazing? You wonder, who could look at this serpent? Who could look? Anybody. Everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. You know who would live when they looked? Only a certain elect. Only a certain few. No, is that not right? No, only, only just a couple. Only the ones that God said, oh, they're my elect. Yes. Those, those that were predestined to look. Right. No. Any man, when he is bitten, when he look, shall be healed. Right. It says in verse number 10, it says, I'm sorry, verse number 
Verse number 8, when he looketh upon it, shall live. When he looketh upon it, shall live. You know what some people would do? They would go, oh, it can't be that easy. I wonder how many people died when their friend was saying, hey, you've been bitten, and all you got to do is look. I wonder how many people said, ah, it can't be that easy. You got to look at, a, you know, look at a, a serpent on a pole. Yeah, it can't be that. I'm not looking at that. You know the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians that they obeyed the gospel. You know how you get saved in any dispensation from Genesis all the way to Revelation? <laughs> you got to obey. You got to obey. Oh, I'm, I, I believe, I believe, but I'm not bringing my lamb to the, to the tabernacle. I'm not bringing a pigeon or turtle dove. I'm not doing that. No way. If you believed it, you would do it. Yeah. And if people believe the gospel, they're going to obey the gospel. It doesn't mean, oh, you've got to look at their life and, and examine them, make sure they got saved. That's between them and God. But people, 1 Thessalonians, they obeyed the gospel. What is it? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They had to believe. And if there's, I'll tell you this, if you're turning to God, it says they turned, this is 1 Thessalonians 1, they turned to God from idols. You could turn from everything else and never turn to God. There's a lot of people, they've heard it such, in such a way that if they didn't turn from this and this and this and this and this, no, you turn to God. And when you turn to God completely and fully, you turn completely and fully from whatever you're trusting in before. That's just repentance. But people put the cart before the horse and have to turn and turn and turn and turn. If you had to turn from all your sins, and we even sing it, victory in Jesus, then I repented of my sins. Yeah. You don't repent of your sins. You can repent as a whole, but you, never, you would never be able to confess all your sins. I thank God. He says in 1 John 1, 9 to the Christian, he says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, no, that's Romans. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from what? All. You say, what if I forget some sins? Thank God. You still, you still go to heaven even if you couldn't confess them. But then he comes by and just cleanses you from all unrighteousness. Thank God for that. Man, I don't have to remember every sin. I try, try to keep, my dad used to say it all the time, keep short accounts with God. Keep short accounts with God. Amen. But if you miss one, thank God, the blood of Jesus Christ, his, son's, his son cleanses us from all sin. All unrighteousness. Amen. What's the result? You got the reason and the reaction, but the result, some people would look and live. Some people would look away. But the result, if they would look, instant healing. There was an instant healing. It didn't take weeks, like the new translations say. Probably takes years and years and years. Yeah. Desire the milk of the word that you may grow up unto salvation. That's what they say. You can get that in your NIV or whatever. Right? No, you desire the sin word of the word that you may grow thereby. You grow in grace, as Peter said, in, in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That, and you grow in grace a whole lot more after you got saved than before. And you can't grow until you're born again. Amen. It's an instant healing. It's an incredible happening. But then there's an idolatrous heresy. How many know Nahushtan? Nahushtan. How many have seen that word? You know, the people after this in 2 Kings 18, Hezekiah ends up removing the high places. He breaks the images, cuts down the groves, and he break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made for it. For under those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it. And he called it Nahushtan, that's Joshua. You know what's amazing? Man has a way of taking things that God once used to bring glory to himself and makes, make idols out of them. And there was a revival down there in, in, in um, Burlington. They were selling the sawdust. Selling the sawdust. What a strange thing. You know, people will do that with men. They'll take a, take a great man of God and they think, well, if it's not... There's, there's people that they'll go to kneel down at a, at a grave and talk to that, that preacher yeah. or ask God to give. I don't need a double portion. I'm not Elisha. I don't need a double portion of, of some, you know, D.L. Moody or, or Charles Spurgeon or somebody or go, right? I go down to Lester Roloff's grave and go pray over that grave sucking and all that nonsense. Yeah. You say, that's a real thing. That is a, it's a real stupid thing is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go to the Lord. And I don't need, and look, I'm all for traditions. The Bible says, tells the Thessalonians, Paul said, keep the traditions which you've been taught, which you've been given. 
There's good things. Your church has traditions that you do. One of those is a fellowship dinner after the morning service, or one, right? That's a great thing. That's enjoyable, right? And I th- here, if it's not unscriptural, unbiblical, there's nothing wrong with it. Amen. I never saw a piano in the Bible. Amen. Piano is just a harp anyway with hammers on it. Amen. That's all it is. But it's not unbiblical, unscriptural. Everybody understand that? You know what happens? People take things that God has used and they worship that instead of worshiping God. The servant Moses lifted up the serpent. Number two, the sinful men lifted up the sun. We understand this. The picture is there, as Jesus said in John chapter 3. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. What's the reason? Similar. Sin. Sickness. Bitten by the serpent. What's the reaction? The wicked reviled Jesus Christ. The religious, what did they do? They mocked Him. Don't, don't be surprised, and I'm sure you've been saved any length of time. The most religious people you meet are the worst. <laughs> you go door to door, right? You go down, you go street preaching, you go, go do anything. The, the person that you would think, just sweet, and, you know, come to the door, and, and just so nasty. And you find out they've been going to church their whole life. And whatever religion it is, you think, I, I've knocked on a door. we got a lot of Catholics where we are, Philadelphia. And go to the door, and somebody come to the door, and they're Catholic. They think it's like a crucifix, and I'm going to walk, you know, like a garlic for a vampire or something, right? And I'm going, oh, you know, right? It's blinding me. No. They, they really think that it's going to turn. But you know what it is? If I were a Catholic, and somebody came to my door, don't you do this if the Jehovah's Witnesses come to your door? Or Mormons? They say, you're going, you know, you're in this cult. You need to be saved. You know what they do? They slam the door in your face. You would think they would try to convert you. You would think they would have compassion on me, but they don't. I've never had a Catholic sit down and try to convert me as I came to, oh, come on in, and then try to convert me to Catholicism. Never once. We knock, a, we knock a lot of doors, but never had them try to convert me. I'm out there trying to witness to them. And some of the most religious people are the most hateful people. It's amazing the people that believe in work salvation have the least works. Yeah. This is just a strange thing. The religious mocked the Lord. The remnant mourned the Lord. There are people that were standing there. John the Beloved being one. His mother there, Mary and uh, uh, Susanna, different ones that were right there. And I'll say this. You got that picture. You got that, uh, that, uh, that uh, carving, whatever it is, the sculpture. It's got Mary. And here's Jesus laying down. How many have seen that picture? And he's laying, it's a big stone thing, and Michelangelo or somebody carved that thing. Mary never touched the body of the Lord Jesus after the crucifixion. Never. Neither did any of the women. The women beheld where he was laid. And I can tell that to Joyce Myers, because there's a whole lot of women who want to handle the body of Christ now, and they're not supposed to. You ever think about that? You know what the high priest, if, if a woman touched him, the sacrifice would have been defiled. Jesus wouldn't let Mary Magdalene touch him after the resurrection because he said he had not yet ascended to his father. So no women are over there putting Jesus in the tomb. They didn't get there till three days later. Amen. And just the same way, same way that the women weren't supposed to handle the body of the Lord, women aren't supposed to handle his body now, the church. See, the reaction is very similar. There are some people There are some people, when they see Jesus on the cross, they see him, and they turn, they say, I I can't remember who said it, but he said it's the look that saves, but it's the gaze that sanctifies. Look and live. Amen? But when you get saved, I wonder how people just stared at that that thing. They're healed. They said, I'm healed, and just kept staring at that serpent on the pole. You know, you get a, there's a whole lot of Christians, they look, they get saved, and then they go down. I don't know if they got bit again, if they would have to look again. <laughs> you ever think about that? I wonder. It, it doesn't say, but I, I, I once look, always look. I don't know. <laughs> I'd have to say that. But I, I, I don't know. But, man, I, I bet there's some people just kept looking at, the, looking at, the cro- at that, I would say, cross. You can't really hang a, hang a serpent on a pole. You ever think about that? Probably have to put a cross across there. Probably had some nails there. 
Well, our deacon, he was doing Sunday school lesson one time, brought that out with, you wonder how he fastened that thing on that pole. You ever think about that? The Bible says, he who knew no sin was made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Colossians says he brought blot out the handwriting of the ordinances that were contrary to us, nailing them to his cross. The thing that you were bitten with or bitten by, that's what you got to look to. He was made sin for us. And so what do we do? We look to Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So we look to him. But there's a lot of Christians, they look and then they go on. And sin keeps biting them. Now they could never die. Physically they could die, but they're going to heaven. But man, sin sure beats them up. But I tell you, if you, those ones that kept looking at that cross, it didn't matter if something bit them again. It didn't matter if they were looking at that cross, if they were looking at that serpent. But Jesus is lifted up. As the serpent was lifted up. I thought about that, and I don't have one here, but I thought about that serpent being on that thing. I wonder how high they lifted that up. Like a, <laughs> like a sniper rifle or something, amen. Amen. I wonder how high he lifted that thing up. You think he just, there's a lot of Christians, they're lifting up Jesus like this. Anybody in the camp. There, he had to get that thing up so it took the minimal effort for anybody. He had to get that thing way up there. There's, if you're going to lift up the Savior, you better do it like Moses did. Lift up that serpent. There was some work involved for Moses to put that serpent on that pole. But once it was done, I wonder if Moses getting that thing together and goes, it is finished. <laughs> and just raise that thing up. Oh, yeah. Put that serpent up on that pole. Look and live, my brother, live. Yeah. Look to Jesus now. He didn't say Jesus. Look, look to the serpent. Hey, that's what we're supposed to do. Right. We're supposed to lift up the Lord Jesus. Right. We're supposed to lift him up. And if he's lifted up, he'll draw all men. Right. Not just some of the elect. Right. <laughs> Not just, all men unto him. Right. We've got to lift him up. And we should be looking unto Jesus. Sinful men lifted up the sun, just like the servant Moses lifted up the serpent. And the last thought, the saved masses are to lift up the Savior. What's the reason? It's the cross of Christ. The Christ of God. Peter says in Luke 9.20, Jesus said, Whom say ye that I am? He said, the Christ of God. And we're supposed to lift up. There's a reason. You know, the church isn't going to be around very long. I don't know how long it is until the rapture, but it's closer today than it was yesterday. Yes, sir. Amen. It could be, to, maybe today my Lord will come for me. Hey, we're to be lifting up the Lord Jesus Christ because there's not a whole lot of time. Yeah. In Dover, Foxcroft, is it a hyphenated here? Is that, that what this is? Is it, is it two communities together, right? I was reading on your website a couple days ago about the camp meeting. You got your camp meeting coming up, revival, and the history of revivals that were here in this town. Would to God, God raise that up again in these last days. It, it could start here. It can. And you're going to get it by lifting up the Lord. Not lifting up man. Not lifting up some celebrity. But lifting up the Lord Jesus. What's the reason we're to lift Him up? The cross of Christ. The Christ of God. The catching away of the church. He's going to come back and He's going to be suspended between heaven and earth. The Bible says every eye shall see Him. Now we know the rapture happens seven years prior to, to the revelation. But the saves are gonna, saved are going to be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. This is going to draw all men and the coming of the Lord. You know what the reaction is for a lot of people? They reject Him. You know what the reaction is for, for some? They accept Him. But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God. You know what the result is? The result is salvation. And the Bible says in Hebrews, and I won't turn there, but he says, And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. The Lord's coming back. I hope you're ready. I hope when he comes back, he'll find us watching, waiting when the Lord shall come. Are you ready? My brother-in-law preached this morning and played that song, When Jesus Comes to Reward His Servants, whether it be noon or night, say, Will He find you uh, watching with our lamps all trimmed and bright. Yeah. Be, be, are you waiting? Are you watching, looking for the coming of the Lord? You know what Philippians says? We're supposed to be holding forth the word of life. Yeah. Now, I can lift up the Lord. You know how you do it? 
by magnifying His Word. Yes. Lift up the Word of God. Yes. That's why you got a pulpit. That's why you got a preacher that stands up here, and he might have a tablet. He might have something here, but he's got the Bible. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I, my wife was reading on her devotions. You know what they do? They change the words in had her Bible, had different text, and it was supposed to be King James. And they can change it. You know what they can't do? They, can't, they can take this, this physically away from me, but they can't take and change the words on this page. They can change your words on a digital copy. I'm, if you've got a tablet, I'm not against you. You're using your phone. That's what you got. That's fine. I think your preacher probably agree with me. It's best to have a Bible. Yeah. Something when your kids uh, get a hold of something after you die, they can look and see maybe some tear stains, oh, yeah. maybe some, some, some of your handwriting. You know, some of the most precious things to me that my dad left are some of his Bibles with his underlines in them. Yeah. Amen. I wouldn't get that on his tablet where he highlighted it. Yeah. Amen. Oh, there's my dad's typing. <laughs> it's, it's not the same. you got to hold the word, holding forth the word of life. Are we lifting up the Savior? I know this church has a good testimony for being a good witness. Support your preacher. Love the Lord. and Live for the Lord. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, he was lifted up 2,000 years ago. But we need to do the same thing. Lift him up. Lift him up. Lift him up for everyone to see. And one day he's coming back and we're, he's going to catch us away and take us to be with him. Lord, I pray that you'll help us. Thank you for this church. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to share some thoughts uh, out of John 3 and Numbers 21. Lord, I pray that you just bless this place. Lord, I pray for the upcoming revival meeting, camp meeting. God, I pray that you'll stir in the hearts of the people. I know a lot of labor and work and love and just sweat and tears go into this meeting coming up. Lord, I pray that you'll help. Give them clarity. Lord, give them, give them just a, uh, a, a direction for this thing. I pray that the preachers that will come in, the singers and everyone that's here, Lord, would just be filled with your Holy Spirit and you do something. Start a fire here that will burn all throughout Maine and down in the New England, Lord. I pray that you'll work as only you can in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand.